Yeah. You got it, Alan, yeah? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, Phil, you just manage the, the waiting room. Anybody else comes in? Yep. Cheers. Take care of that. Okay. Perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the, the sixth of our Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland webinar series. Um, hope everybody is safe and well wherever you are in the world. Um, Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland, comprised of Ed Collin, Phil Carney, Alan Dunton, and myself, Ollie Logan. And the last five or six weeks, we've been uh, fortunate to have a, a number of um, really great guests um, who were lined up for our conference, which unfortunately due to the situation we, we had to cancel. Um, but we've done uh, five of these now and you know we've got another uh, two great guests um, lined up today to, to talk about their work that, that, that they do. Um, we're really keen in these that we promote the discussion in the webinar. So if you do have a question today and you're in the webinar with us, please put that in the chat section, which is down there. And uh, one of us will, will pick that up and, and, um, and come to you to ask your question um, after uh, uh, Mark and Dennis have presented today. We're also streaming on YouTube Live. So hello, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, if you wanna ask a question from there, please post it in the comment section and uh, then we'll ask that to uh, Mark and, and Dennis after the presentation. For those of you, that, of you in the webinar, I um, request that you keep your uh, microphones on mute and if we do need to come to you for a question, then we'll unmute you um, to be able to ask that. So that's uh, all of the housekeeping elements from me. Uh, I'm going to head over to Ed Collin to introduce today's guests. Thanks, Ali, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, again, this is, this is always a nice brief little intro just to, to kind of set the scene. Um, the, the first person I'm going to speak to is Marco Sullivan, who has been a friend of ours at MSAI from, from the get-go. He spoke at our first conference in 2018. And as soon as we, we knew we were going to go again, it was, it was just a matter of uh, making sure that we could find a way to make sure that we could have Mark back again. And as soon as we started discussions with it, it became apparent that his, his colleague at AIK, Dennis Hortin, was going, to, was going to be a part of what he was doing. Uh, Dennis is the head of development there. And the work that they, these guys are doing at AIK is essential um, for, for the kind of conversations we have at MSAI because they're challenging traditions, they're challenging concepts, and they're open to that challenge. They're more than happy to engage in these questions from what's happening at the child level, what's happening with the people who engage with the children uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they're developing, but also as they progress through their development and in through adolescence and beyond. And I suppose to echo what Ali was saying, please engage with these guys. These are people who are practitioners on the ground dealing with the kind of problems that a lot of people on here maybe are facing in their own work with young people. And, and again, it, to get it from the horse's mouth, it's really important that you, that you do ask these questions. We, we know as, as people who've engaged with, the, with, especially with Mark over the years, the questions are always welcome and the answers are always hugely informative and they and they really do have an impact on how we we engage in our work ourselves so really looking forward to this uh, thank you so much mark and dennis for your time and uh, and over to you guys uh, thank you very much yeah thank yeah. you thank you so uh, dennis and i are both very happy to be in virtual cork <laughs> so a big welcome to all the virtual not cork people um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so just, just before we start, we're gonna speak about the work we're doing at AIK Football. Um, <clears throat> basically the title says Reconceptualizing, Reconceptualizing Player Development at AIK Youth Football. And it's kind of important. This is no silver bullet. This is no solution. This is no, it's not the perfect way or anything. We're, we're just giving some insight into how we're working maybe a bit of the theoretical underpinnings and the practice and our thoughts around it. And hopefully people can take something back from it because there, there seems to be um, some kind of big problem, I think, around player development of football where we have to have a certain model from a certain country and we need to do what they do. And that kind of ignores all the social, cultural, historical constraints that underpin a lot of the football in the country. So 
it's like as as uh, my friend Jorg and and uh, Jan who are from the Dutch FA you know you can't they say to me is you can't take the Dutch approach and just dump it into Ireland or Sweden or anything you see we should be really looking at trying to create something that's by tr by starting to investigate our own country and build on that so what we're going to do is um we're going to begin briefly with uh Dennis is going to speak about the background of youth football in Sweden and the process that lead up to the AIK decision okay yeah um okay so um the the Swedish like sport system in general is very it's it's based on volunteer work uh it's huge amount of parents involved um uh, football is the absolute biggest sport uh in Sweden um in in we're, we're founded by uh basically tax 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 money is basically paying for uh, like every kind every activity that you have um generates a, a certain amount of, of money from from tax money uh so obviously that's that's not uh, something that uh, makes us swim in money but it's like a small contribution that we can uh, use to like help develop uh, the club uh, maybe pay small, small salaries uh, for, for some coaches and things like that. So it's definitely not a huge contribution there. Um, uh, but if we go into to AIK, as, um, as in uh, we have um, our men's team play in the top league uh, in Sweden and the girls team plays in the second highest team. Uh, so that obviously generates some more sponsor uh, streams uh, so we're we're in a better position financially than than like your average club in sweden and i think that's uh, important to mention as well um but i would however say that what we're going to talk about here uh, will it, these are principles and we think that they can operate even in in organizations that ha don't have uh, the the sort of financial uh, power if you will say uh, that AIK has um, so yeah just want us to said that say that yeah I think this is what we spoke with Tony Stradwick about he asked us could you do what you do and uh, where he is some in England or some else and we said yes and no yes because the principles are applicable but no don't do exactly what we do mm -hmm. yeah 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 mm -hmm. um, so in terms of um, uh, yeah we, we let's say if, let's say five years ago uh, in AIK, we had uh, a traditional early selection system for both boys and girls, uh, but we have 1500 players. So it's not your traditional setup where you have a club and you have one team in each age group or one team for each gender. We have multiple teams in each age group, which is an important aspect to consider with how we want to structure ourselves. Because when you have um, a selection part of a wider sort of more recreational type club, it means that you have internal frictions between coaches and between players. So it's really not beneficial. And that like our reflection was that it wasn't really beneficial for us to work in that way. I'm not gonna say anything about other clubs or how they operate, but, but for us, it was not uh, beneficial. It became, it became a case of competition within teams and, and within the club uh, that doesn't really help us to, 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 to learn and develop as individuals, as teams, as, as a football club. Um, we have, uh, uh, yeah, b based on that, we, um, we were starting to look into, okay, so how can we structure the club differently so we more uh, get these teams and all these players and all these coaches and all these parents um, to, um, to more pull in the same direction, um, to, to use uh, the amount of people uh, for for like a ben, more beneficial uh, in a more beneficial way than than when people are competing with each other. So how can we cooperate? Uh, it's rather the question. Um, uh, we we um, we then decided to okay. So this uh, early selection from eight into nine year olds, uh, we need to push that up in the first stage. So we did the, that in 2017. We pushed it up from nine to 13 years old. Um, and uh, for context, I can say that the Swedish FA is uh, suggesting around 15, 16 years of age for, for this process. Uh, so we, we are not uh, sure that we are 
in any way uh, doing this right, but we are moving in a direction. And I think that's the key point here that we are moving and uh, not exactly where we want to be because probably we have some other decisions to take up the road, uh, but, but this is for now. Uh, and then also when you look at the, the, the structural aspects that, I mean, if you look at player development, it happens in the micro, it happens in the meetings with the coach and with the pedagogy, but also the structure in the club can also help or inhibit what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and then if you look even further beyond that, there is obviously bigger sports systems with, so how do other clubs operate and how do other sports operate and um, how do the national governing bodies operate and how do the, the, the national governing body for sports operate. So there's, there's, there's a really big system, like an onion, you can scale la 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 uh, layer on layers. Uh, so we're trying to really, really uh, reach as far out in these layers as we possibly can. We're talking to uh, partner clubs. We're talking about school in our areas. Uh, we're talking to politicians uh, because we think that how we interact with, with wider systems influence uh, our microsystem. So uh, we're, we're really trying to take a, such a, a, as a broad, uh, broad take as possible, uh, but with the key aspect, it's gonna happen in the micro. It's players are gonna you know, feel well, enjoy playing football, learn and develop uh, so so yeah uh, so we can probably go into the next slide here yeah yeah so and the thing is what's what's what Dennis was very much a part of the process that led up to this decision um, it included uh, it was about a year and a half process wasn't it yeah a year about yeah. year 2016 it was a process of year there was um, Swedish FA were involved local politicians researchers Dennis is one of the people that was invited in um, scouts uh, the Bayern Munich scout actually yeah. was a uh, head scout was invited in. So there was this group formed where they discussed um, child youth sport. And from that, a dis um, the club decided from these discussions, uh, reflected and came up with um, a decision to remove the early selection, uh, push it up from eight to 13. But the club will be guided by three, pr three main principles. So everything we do is guided by the following three principles you see in your screen. It's children's well-being. Follow the relevant uh, guideline documents like United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the other national governing um, guidelines. The UN Convention on the Rights of Children is now low in Sweden from the 1st of uh, January. It's low in sport. Mm. So um, that again, that still has to be, we're going to see how that is implemented, but it really shows the, the, the determination for uh, to have a more... Uh, sound child-centered uh, 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 environment in, in sport in Sweden. And then of course we want to increase the development and promotion of players to our own uh, senior teams and uh, uh, under 16 teams, under 17, under 19. So basically you could just sum it as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. So that's everything is guided by those three uh, main goals. Uh, we employed a full-time value working so we call it AIK style um, somebody who basically works with the club values full-time out in the pitch meeting parents meeting coaches meeting us it's us as well that person is there so we are also maintaining the club's values in our practice and our communication and our daily interactions with people um, increase the opportunities for interactions in the 8 to 12 group um, meaning that we've employed a head coaches in each age group. So kids come to us at six. We have a football school once a week. Teams are formed by school, geography, friendships, neighborhoods. And then at eight, they kind of come into what's more a league, a league system uh, where they play games and they form, what we, I guess you could call proper teams if you want. So in each age group, we'd have about over hundred kids. Um, that, that would mean there's about six, seven teams because they play such a small five aside, and each age group then would have a head coach who would be out working with the with the with the parent coaches in the practice, educating, helping, and supporting. Yeah, I, I think one thing there to to perhaps mention that could be of value is that in today uh, today everything is about digitalization and emailing and apps. So what we're trying to do is to analog is <laughs> do analogization. Uh, so to actually create opportunities for people to meet and have conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's so common that 
or I, I can see a trend in youth football where, where it's just getting less and less of quality, honest conversations between people. Uh, so that's really, really uh, sort of like a key thing that we've been trying to get to. So like, uh, where is the coffee a place located at the at the ground, you know, mm -hmm. is, 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 it, can we sit together? Can we have conversations there? Um, okay, all the people that, that have worked traditionally with administration before, they have no administration. All they mm -hmm. do is go out, meet coaches, have conversations, create interactions, mm -hmm. because we think that's the, the, the meat or the stuff where, where, where you can actually bring people together and where you can have um, proper development in my in my view it, it's and it's it's a way to develop things that is not personally connected to one person either because traditionally if you only work with information uh, and there's a strong leader and uh, something is happening in the organization but then that leader steps away for some reason and then the whole organization drops back to where it was before so it's very very important that that everyone in the organization is carrying this uh, this direction of travel uh, so it has to live in the interactions between every people in the club. Yeah, we've, we've found that if you, the more invitations for interactions you create in child youth sport, like we do it, it dissolves a lot of the hierarchical structures yeah. and creates more networks. And um, then the, the, the final part of the puzzle really for us, I guess, was uh, building the AIK Research and Development Department. We, we found that there was a need for this, particularly because James Vaughan, who's just completed his PhD and I'm doing my PhD, that we, we utilized those opportunities to um, basically do our own research and in, investigate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we, we uh, in 2017, when this decision about um, pushing up the, the, the selection, we, we, we quickly realized that, okay, but th that, that's, the, that's the easy part to, to just make a decision on paper then it is, okay, so how are we actually gonna work with this and how, how what is gonna inform how we do? Um, so we thought that we were gonna start uh, an organ or, or a part of the club that's called uh, research and development. Uh, and basically you could say what that is, is that we are trying to, um, to get as deep and rich of an insight as possible into our own environment. Um, then obviously in any method or any way to generate data there's definitely holes and then you have to connect that with people that have been in the club for long that have experience and then when you have that conversation is that 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 becomes a really really rich conversation and that's where you are more likely in my opinion to take wise decisions about how or when or why to do things um, so, 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 yeah, th th I really want to emphasize that that's how we work there. It's not a, uh, a way to bring in a, a research paper from somewhere else and say, hey, this is the right answer. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not like that at all. Uh, and we, we, yeah, we put together an abstract, which you can see just the headline of there. And we went down to um, a conference down in Barcelona in, in October 2017 and presented uh, there as sort of a starting point for for the research and development group. Um, yeah, and that was kind of, that was that was really the launch of a, a research and development department. So the thing is, it gave us this gave us some good 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 insight into what we're looking and what we considered basically development being deeply contextual, uh, occurring in ongoing in process of ongoing development changes, sociology and in sociological contexts and countless contextualized reciprocal interactions between people play, and places. So it's really just a very deep, as Dennis said, um, investigation of our own environment to try and gain an understanding of context and create our own knowledge. And I think Dennis can start actually give some insight into this using. Yeah. Um, one thing that, I mean, this is James, um, or I sh firstly, I should say that the design here is from the Player Development Project. Um, you can see it on, on um, online uh, but the, the model um, the, the base of the model is by ecological model by Bronfenbrenner uh, and James when he did his um, uh, his research he, he actually he used this model then because he found themes as he went on to collect data in our environment which we then mapped up uh, here uh, in this way 
so we can see some of the macro. Uh, if you look down left on national culture, you have, we have equality, social welfare, industry, linear thinking is quite clear, uh, like from the macro. Uh, if you look up uh, left, you have a youth culture where it's about you know achievement or social media is in there as well. It's about fashion, how you look. Um, Scandinavian design is, is uh, one thing there as well. I guess that's probably more, more for the bit, perhaps the older uh, young people, but it's still, still, still an important thing. Uh, our football culture upright is that we have um, uh, a lot of <laughs> very passionate fans and we have from the 70s, uh, we have had a lot of English influence. We've had English coaches here that coached our Premier League teams in, on the men's side from the 70s. And in the 80s, we watched uh, four, four o'clock or I guess that would be three o'clock games uh, uh, in England. Uh, the, it's called the Tips Lada, or like the, yeah, the football. <laughs> yeah, football Saturday. Um, and then in, in, in the 90s, we had Sundays and then we started to watch Italian football. Uh, so the Italian and the English influences are really, really strong in our football culture. Uh, so and to know these kind of things has actually helped us to um, to navigate uh, this complexity better because we understand at least some of the influences that we have. Uh, I can guarantee you that we have missed millions of influences in this map here, but these are like the most the, the strongest ones. Um, yeah, um, social media is definitely uh, in there. And uh, if you can see that there is um, uh, in down left, you have uh, industry and linear thinking. It's, it's, it's in, in bold. Uh, and then you can see performance anxiety between the macro and the micro. It's also in bold. And then you have the academy. So, and that's just to highlight one of the kind of conversations that we had because if you have a macro and you have parents and kids and coaches that assume that development is linear you have to get into the system early to be to stay uh, that means that it drives early specialization to get good quick uh, and when you have that kind of macro influences and you have an early selection model in between there we saw that or our our reflections was that some of the players or many of the players actually had performance anxiety because of these influences. So in a, in a different culture with different macro aspects, with different micro aspects, it might not lead to a performance anxiety. But for us, we saw that this, this sort of um, mix was quite toxic for us. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how we can use this. And then obviously in the micro, you can see that we have coach education, we have a corporate setup for part of the club, we have a first team, we have an academy, we have a code of conduct, uh, you obviously have family, school, peers, uh, our club, other sports. So this is actually one picture that really, really helps us to, to navigate uh, and to not lose track of what kind of uh, factors that we have to deal with. But, but they, again, this is definitely not everything and it's always in and a constant flux uh, this but yeah i think that's i think uh, going back to the performance anxiety bit uh, dennis mentioned earlier about um kids competing with each other in the old system at aik and actually we it's one of one of the things we identified is that in certain teams particularly the early selected teams that children were competing against each other to keep their place in the team so they were in a team competing against each other and then when they are going, getting older and they're just supposed to play senior football, they're supposed to collaborate with each other. So we're teaching them to compete with each other, but really at the top level, you have to collaborate to succeed and win. So this, this was a, an issue we were um, highlighting. Yeah. So um, then when we go into the, mi the micro, uh, a lot of my work, there was a lot of challenges and key constraints that we had to start working with. First of all, the biography of coaches shaped by landscapes of traditional uh, coaching practice and coaching education programs, very linear structured coach education programs. Here's your starting point and you'll finish here. Even coach education programs, everyone has the same starting point and everyone's supposed to end the same at the same point as well. There's really, there, it's not really a journey. It's just a, a bunch of little quick blocks and steps. And it's even, we, we found that this was um, one, of the, one of the things inhibiting coaches. Um, there's also within the coaching education and within the tradition of Swedish football, there was this culturally dominant planning paradigm where coaches 
decided a theme and you turn up at, a, at your coaching with children and here's the theme you've just given them the answer you know the theme is passing oh well there's the answer so everyone had to have a team and then a theme and then uh, the coach would decide the sequence and the length of with of, of each section and then predetermined coaching points and i really saw this when i was working as coach educator delivering the swedish fa coach education is that coaches would, would have predetermined coaching points and they would set up a session and they would look for these predetermined coaching points in the session, as opposed to observing what was happening in the session, coaching around the, the interactions with players. And then, of course, be, because of the, 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 the skills and the attributes that were appreciated in our club, were, were culturally embedded in a lot of the pedagogical approaches that we use in the club, the organisation and the structure, the early selection. So, of course, that meant that the early maturers, the fast, quick, muscular players were the ones being selected really early it's because we were identifying those with, the, with those skills because they, they were what needed to survive very young or, or they gave the illusion of, of, of what you call, if you want to call it, talent. And then also in design, we found that a lot of players were just basically props and some kind of coach narrative where they learned to play an, an ideal, ideal, idealized model of the game as opposed to the game itself, meaning that the coach would tell them, we build a play, a keeper, pass it to him, pass there. And there's all these defined patterns that would be regurgitated on match day. And of course, these are very successful when you're working with nine and 10 year olds, but kids didn't own one of the decisions and this we found this to be problematic because they were learning a model of the game as opposed to the game themselves yeah and maybe i can just add that in general uh, no matter if we talk about club development or team development or player development is that uh, anything that takes us atten our attention away from paying attention where it matters it's not going to help us. So that's not to say that measurements or a game model or planning does not have a place because it surely has. But the thing is that when, when, you, when that uh, attracts your attention away to paying attention to the athletes or to the players, to the persons, their needs, uh, the team, and, uh, and at, even at the organizational level, that, that's where you have to challenge the, the, how much you need these kind of things. So it's, it's they have a place, but as soon as you it attracts your attention away to paying attention where it matters, that's where it becomes a, a, a bit of a challenge. Mm. So for us, uh, the place to really start then was in the micro systems of practice because it's very hard to to start uh, starting out in the macro. So our, our work is mainly in, in the micro, and it's just like putting a stone into water, and we're hoping that it ripples out in, in and echoes out into history and into the macro. So we formed the research and development department, we formed something we call AIK base. And uh, there is a theoretical framework, a pedagogical concept, a football concept, and we have our principles of play. So the theoretical framework that underpins our work at the club is ecological dynamics. If you, you can, Keith and um, Rick Shuttleworth might have mentioned that previously in their, um, in their talks, but we really don't need to go into it too much now, but the pedagogical concept then is normally in a pedagogy, like representative learning design, ideas of repetition without repetition, more instead of repeating the same movement that there's variate, there must be variation in what we do. So instead of two people passing to the ball to each other, just nonchalantly just hitting it, just put, put somebody in the middle and suddenly you have the pass happening, repetition without repetition, because there is some sort of information they have to self-organize around. So that's just a very simple example. And uh, the manipulation of constraints where you adjust pitch task, uh, the task for pitch size, rules, et cetera. But the, the idea of representative learning design is quite central because a lot of the, the uh, training wasn't very representative of the game. It was quite reductionist. This, of course, comes back to the old coach education in Sweden. So a good example I can give you of, it has, for us, it has to feel, it has to see and feel like the game. So. It's the day before you're under 16s play a cup game and you're working on tactical corners because so you're trying to score from uh, uh, corners so you usually have some guy out in the corner with 50 balls you have the fence and you have the attackers and you just hit the balls and bomb 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 like that but really that's not representative because that never happens because there is no consequence so the idea for us would be that okay you can do this but if the defending team win the ball 
give them something like a line 30 meters away they have to dribble over and so then they get something so there's a consequence for the tactical corner not working so that's how we would explain um, more representative learning design the football concept then is football interactions we're moving from speaking about actual actions to interactions and um, I guess that this this also when we go back to it how people play for skills have history Every child arrives with you with a bibliography of opportunities and experiences that were offered to them up to that point. So skills have history. So we understand that skills are underpinned by a sociocultural hist uh, historical background. And this, that's why we call them interactions. So if, if, you're sh if you're practicing shooting and you're shooting at a goalkeeper, it's not the actual, the technique of the shot. It's, oh, it, it, it includes the goalkeeper being aware of where the goalkeeper's positioned etc and it's that interaction that's important between the, 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 the shooter and the goalkeeper because i've seen sessions where people are saying wow that's that's a beautiful beautiful shot and like of course the kid doesn't score or anything but it's, it's a perfect technique but really you know the, the the goalkeeper could have probably gone and bought a hot dog or something and the kid wouldn't have noticed because it was more concerned with the technique so it's actually focusing more on the information as well and seeing it as an interaction that a that a pass is an interaction when you pass to a player it changes the system a bit and you're in it's it's a load of interactions with opponents with your teammates so we don't see the pass as just an action we see it as a far deeper thing and behind all that there's a social cultural context as well yeah, it's a, it's a, an um an intention and attention um it's um yeah and then uh, principles of play is to guide our coaches in possession, search, discover, exploit space and gaps using football interactions like dribble, pass, shoot, and then recovering the ball, close space and gaps and minimize possibilities for opponent to, to opponents to utilize football interactions and win the ball. So that's how we're looking at getting to analyze their training is that are players searching, discovering, exploiting space and gaps or are they trying to minimize it for opponents? And of course, then we're working with a lot of uh, parent coaches. So it's very important for us. So how do we explain all this to them? It's like the, the idea, this is a great line that I've, got, I've stolen from Dennis. We start where people are at, not where we want them to be. So we're working with parent coaches. So how do we get this message across? And so one thing we're, we're trying to encourage them is, is based on this graph is that in your session, evaluate it from, is there a ball? Is there an opponent? Is there a direction? And is there a consequence? And is everybody active? The consequence meaning, of course, in when you're working with eight, nine rules, if you lose the ball, the opponent can possibly score a goal or do something. So there is actually a consequence. So ball, opponent, direction, consequence, everybody active. Yeah, and then just one thing to add there is like traditionally, sometimes uh, we like to, to structure the game in uh, attacking or to, to transition uh, each way or, or defense. Uh, and and it's actually the in, in our point of view it's the transition between all of these that are interesting so it, if we look at the game uh, and we separate it in four sort of boxes then it might not help us to to see the whole uh, so uh, that's why we want the consequence to be there because then we connect attacking to example for transition and defending yeah. Uh, it's it's and, in the concept, and of course, this is important because this, these words like resilience and things get thrown around very e easy. And the one like, you know, if you want to develop any form of resilience, you, just, you it's important that it's in the design as well. That there is a consequence, and that the player understands the consequence and then wants to win the ball back. So we, we resilience is not something you throw or give to people or give to players. It's also involved in the design over a long period of time. It's an interaction with individual over an environment over a long period of time. So it, it's kind of interesting. I, I find a lot of these conversations, oh, we need more resilience. Mm -hmm. But yet then look at your training. There's no consequence. It's just completely reductionist and isolated. But so to finish up anyway, we're, pre we're more or less finished. We're, we're just going to show you this. This is from, we, we, in Sweden, we're still training. Our kids are still training. They're still playing games. So this is actually from about 10 days ago these uh, sessions. So we're just gonna show a one and a half minute film. It's very simple. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll send on the, uh, this um, presentation to the guys at MSA 
And these are two designs and are very, very simple designs. We're working with parent coaches. There's limited, uh, probably limited um, field space, probably limited equipment, it depends. So we're, we're facilitating the pedagogy as well around that. So these are the two sessions. So you can just have a look. These are eight-year-olds and a couple of nine-year-olds, I think. Again, in possession, search, discover, exploit gaps and space. You can also see like the, the direction and the consequence and the activity mm -hmm. uh, here and yeah. Point guard, does the kids come up with themselves support from behind? So again, these are just eight-year-olds, and here's a uh, girls. I think they're nine and ten. Exact same session, just a bit more, a bit of a bigger pitch. They've decided to use here. Again, the coach felt that you need to manipulate the um, size of the pitch to to work. Very important. These are mixed groups. There is no ability grouping at all in this. These are very random mixed groups. So, I think uh, the future, do you want to just briefly mention that then? Uh, well, um, yeah, very, very short. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, player development is, uh, is a long time. It's a 15-year long period from five years when they step into pre-football school and when they are 19 or 20 or perhaps is playing for the senior team. Um, and when you see challenges in 13 to 19 is that maybe the solution or, or one thing to look at is what's happened eight to 12, as opposed to just direct your intervention straight to a challenge that you can see in your own environment. Because the, there is a, a principle of a complex system is that you have delayed feedback. Uh, so when you get feedback at 13 or at 15 or at 19, uh, then from an ecological take, then that means that, okay, so if you look, only at 15 if that's where the challenge is then it's not likely that you're gonna uh, get to the root it's more like symptom treatment uh, so it's so important to keep the the whole um, system in mind uh, and traditionally we tend to spend a lot of money at the boys 19 right <laughs> uh, but but it's not necessarily so that the coach there is gonna be able to compensate 14 years of, of uh, it's <laughs> substandard practice, you know, if, if that's like the, the case. So, so we really attend to the whole system uh, and, and value the five, six, seven-year-old practices equally as the 19. Then obviously there, there, is, uh, um, there, there are differences, yes, but, but uh, it's, um, it's important to, to, to look at the whole uh, to, to, to get yeah, uh, the, the, the effect that we want in terms of participation, personal development and performance. So basically just to summarize, we, we consider learning and development as deeply contextual, occurring in context of ongoing developmental changes in social ecological context, yeah. subject to countless contextualized reciprocal interactions between people and places. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's great, Dennis. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. There's uh, a huge number of questions I know that I've um, generated listening to that and, and others I can see coming through as well. Uh, we're going to go straight over to questions. Um, and uh, first one I'm going to call upon is uh, uh, Jan uh, Verbeek. So Jan, I've just unmuted you there. So you thank should be you. able to ask your question so that if there's any follow up, you can you can continue with that as well. Thank you, Phil. Uh, great presentation, uh, guys. Really, really enjoyed it. 
will be oh, yeah, difficult. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. It will be difficult to uh, top this next week. Um, <laughs> I just have a well, a rather simple question. I think is the the terminology you use seems fairly complex, literally at at first glance. How did you inform the 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 coaches? How did you inform, especially the parent coaches, which well turn up after work, deliver a training session. It might not be that easy for them to, to comprehend your, your, your approach. You, you briefly touched upon it, but I'm, I'm curious, how did you stumble across any, any resistance? Yeah, of course. I mean, the thing is you're, you're probably changing people's worldviews because there is a, a system capture. They, a lot of them work the way they've always worked. They've been told how to work. So there are those challenges, but you cannot force these things on people. This is, again, as Dennis pointed out, through countless, countless interactions. And you try and nudge them in, in a way. I mean, just asking them, okay, can you, can you evaluate your practice in the coming weeks around ball, opponent, uh, direction, and consequence? And can we, can we discuss your practice around that when I arrive? So I can say, okay, I want to come to practice now. Can we discuss it around these words? So that's one possible way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think also that um, the, the, there, is, there is that part, you, you can definitely simplify things. And then that, that's like, yeah, the, the simple picture we had with like, um, yeah, activity, consequence, direction, things like that, you, you can simplify it. Uh, but then there's, I guess, another level. And um, that's like, uh, it's, let's say a term like interactions. Mm. It's not the, the, the hardest word in the world, mm. uh, but if, if you are not keen or willing to engage and, and want to change, then yeah, then that becomes a, a hurdle for, for some. Mm. Uh, but that, that's not a reason to remove it mm. because we think that the word in itself is so rich and it gets to what we're trying to, to achieve. So then it's more about having this conversation and we also need to understand that it's a bit of a paradigm shift and a paradigm shift does not come, come easy and you cannot force it. You have just to, to interact and create the conditions for it to happen. And when it happens, it happens, but we don't know when, when everybody's uh, changing or everybody's not changing. That's not really my or Mark's job. It, it's, we, we try to create the conditions and then the system will take itself depending on the, the type and the quality of those interactions. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, there's definitely a, a part of this where you simplify things, a part of it where you do keep some of the terminology because it's important for where you're going to go. Uh, and, and then there's obviously, I mean, the theoretical parts underpinning all of this and in the research and development discussions. And yeah, and there, there we, we, we use uh, different type of terminology. So, so it depends. Uh, where in the club you are in interacting uh, mm -hmm. and to who, uh, how you speak. But yeah, it's a very important thing uh, with the terminology, 100%. Okay. Well, great, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Talk soon. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. We've got lots of questions. So I'm going to go straight over to uh, Stephen Williams, who's got the next question. So, Stephen, I've unmuted you there if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, sure. It was really simple, actually. You talked about how that particular girls group had uh, mixed ability. I was just wondering if... No, all the groups have mixed ability. That's what I was... That was the question. Do all the groups have mixed ability? Yeah, we don't have any ability grouping at all in 8 to 12. Okay, that was my question. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. I might, I might actually just follow up on that because... So can you talk us through our reasoning behind that? That's much the reasoning behind, actually, but uh, what was the reaction when you introduced the mixed ability to everywhere and how did you manage that reaction? Um, I, um, th there is this, uh, um, the, the challenge here is that uh, what, 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 what at least what we think traditionally underpin this idea that you have to play with equals uh, to, to be able to learn, uh, it's, it's, for us it's more been a way to um, uh, um, what can I say? Like um, it, it's been um, it, it's 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 a very complex mix of different motives and why you want to play sport and what's important. So for for some uh, kids and perhaps some parents, it's important to win. Uh, but uh, the easier you win, the better because then you don't have to fight so much. 
Uh, so then it becomes the opposite to learning, actually, that is underpinning these kind of thoughts and ideas. So, uh, and I'm not saying that this ability group might work in, in another context, but for us, it was uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater kind of thing. It's it, like they, they hide some intentions in why they want to do in a certain way, because they uh, think that equal ability equals best learning. And we don't really think that's true. And uh, we think that if you have uh, a variation of abilities, it means that different players or different individuals will, will develop different types of skills. Uh, so you will probably develop personality skills like empathy and, you know, body language and helping your teammates. And, you know, it's, it's more of an emphasis on, on how we do this together and how we, how we bring value together here. Uh, and then, yes, it's, it's definitely uh, easier to win games if, if everybody is at the same level. And when someone is missing a pass, then you can't point your finger. But for us, it's about sending the message that the development does not rely on anything that is extrinsic to you. It de depends on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, it is a complex question, but uh, we see that sometimes we actually rob opportunities for personal development and learning when we do these kind of streamlined or, or sur at surface streamlined tracks or paths or teams to belong to. And it's really, uh, it's, it's helicopter parenting or pampering in, in my opinion, uh, at the core of this idea. You know, what I found was that in, in the data I was collecting for my, my PhD was that uh, parents who had already had a child that went through the older system and now have a child in the new system, they're really happy because even though they bought into the old system first, that this was the way and the best way, they, they, they never realized until a while later how stressful it was on them and how stressful it was on their child. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, it's, they see that this is serious, a, a kind of, well, serious that it's fun, but it's, it's quite a well-developed pedagogy we're working, kids are playing football, that there's a lot more in open interactions between the club, between the coaches, between the parents and the kids, and that they see this motivation climate as something that they find is more beneficial because they see the difference in their kids and how less stressed they are mm. in relation to their sport. Yeah, and I also want to add that the, the, the way we're, we're setting up uh, uh, the, the structure in the club is that it will put huge demands on the players to be learners. So it's actually a very tough system that we're setting up, but we do obviously give support when, when they have some sort of sport related or maybe personal trauma or whatever, and no one is excluded, but it's, it's an extreme emphasis, emphasis on learning. And it's an extreme emphasis on doing what you can control yourself like be on time, be positive, help your teammates, you know, run maximum yourself, uh, but you cannot control the referee, you cannot control the coach, you cannot control your teammates, you cannot control your opponents. So put less emphasis on that. We see them as endless learning opportunities. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think, gentlemen, that uh, that answer is one of the reasons that I'm really glad we're recording this so that we can go back and listen to that again. I think there's a huge amount in that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to jump over to Dennis Hines next. So Dennis, I've just unmuted that you're there if you want to ask your question. Okay, hi lads. Uh, hope you're all well, well done on, on the presentation. Uh, good to see a fellow Dennis leading the, leading the charge. Uh, the menace. My question there is just in relation to futsal. I've been a, a long time advocate of it. Uh, unfortunately, progression in Ireland is a little bit slower than we would like, but just want to see, does futsal play a role within your pathway? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it does kind of naturally because we have quite a pretty rough winter. So, I mean, for, for us, we, we have heated pitches, but in general, in like the sports system in general in Sweden is that futsal is quite big. It's or it's more called five aside. It's not the exact same rules, but it's an indoor and it's 5v5 and it's not the exact same rules. So it's, it's more like natural to us actually to have that in, in part of the season. Uh, and then obviously some of the ideas around futsal is, is very similar to the practice design when you do 2v2 or 3v3 or 4v4s. So I would say it's, it's quite, um, futsal is, is, is um, definitely part of our development system. Uh, 
but not not futsal in, in the sense that it's futsal rules but but the format and the indoor and the more heavy ball and things like that they're, they're, it's more traditional football rules inside and five side so it's not this passing back to the keeper and even though i see value in that as well because they have to value when to go and yeah things like that so but but yeah it's definitely it's definitely important and i think that we naturally have have that in our system okay thank you thank you Dennis. Great. Now, uh, speaking of systems, Gary Hunt has a, has a really good question around uh, the Irish system. Gary, I've unmuted you there if you want to ask your question. Yeah, on the ball, lads. Um, well done on the presentation. Uh, just to allude back to one of the earlier questions there when you were talking about the, the academy guys. Uh, so in League of Ireland, uh, we start that under 13 age group, um, as you're probably aware of. And um, a lot of the clubs, we don't have academies under this. So we rely a lot on, say, the grassroots clubs to... Um, do a lot of our development and, and we don't really have a say in our partnerships with much of that. Do you have any advice on say how to how to improve this collaboration say? Collaboration between? Say our League of Ireland clubs and our grassroots clubs with regards to players when they come into us at under 13. That's it. Maybe we have a lot of clubs around us that we have partnerships with and what we have found is that um, because I guess AIK would have been what you call the apex predator there years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. It would have been the uh, the big club that could have taken any player it wanted at eight or nine from any other club. Oh, he's good. We'll take him. He's good. We'll take him. But we've stopped all that. We actually don't allow it. We've done a uh, contract with nine clubs, a deal with nine clubs, neighbouring clubs around us. I suppose you could call them grassroots clubs if you want. But we, we're a grassroots club, I think. Yeah. Um, and really we don't take players and then it's just they will probably hope they will inform us when they think players should come to us i guess and also that's that's a, a discussion between the club the parents the two clubs yeah. and the parents as well so it doesn't become our decision anymore of just head hunting the best player at nine and then the best player at ten it becomes a longer discussion and trust and we actually go up and we educate do education with these clubs as well so the stronger they are, the better it is for us in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think in general, what is lacking at the micro and the macro level is, uh, is actually uh, communication and, and conversation and collaboration. Uh, so uh, what we're really trying to do is to have um, real conversations, just meet these. We have nine partner clubs in our region, in Stockholm, the Northern region, and we meet them on a regular basis. And it's an equal, um, uh, collaboration it's not like we are sitting in the center and they are around us we, we are helping them they are helping us we change ideas and we give some of our ideas to or all of our ideas to them and uh, they give us ideas and it actually makes us all better and we also understand um, that it's about not the, the individual clubs it's about the player so mm -hmm. if, if, if it's valuable for this player to move at this age yeah, then that player move. If it's not, then that player does not move. So, so it's really centered about the needs of the, the, the player and not the needs of the club yeah. or the needs of a coach. And not, which the, I, and not the ability of the player. That, that snapshot in time is the focus. It's more their needs. Yeah. So I think to get that kind of conversation going that like goes in beneath this, uh, uh, the, the, the most immediate sort I mean, of challenge. Gary, Gary, was, uh, as we said earlier, what we did is when working with our parent coaches, if you want to, if you want to um, <clears throat> dissolve hierarchies, which there apparently is in Ireland between the, if League of Ireland clubs are grassroots, yeah, yeah. if you want to dissolve this, I think that there needs to be more opportunities for interactions between clubs. These have to yeah. be created and offered. Um, and I think that's probably the new FAI's job as well, to see these, this culture uh, give opportunities and facilitate it for this culture to emerge. Brilliant, lads. Appreciate that. Yeah. Cheers, Gary. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Gary. Great question and, and a great answer again. Uh, we're going to go across now to Michael Kenny. Michael, you're unmuted, so you can ask your question. Uh, hi, lads. Uh, thanks, William, for a brilliant presentation. Um, I suppose my question is based around the values worker within the club. Um, I suppose it's a two pronged question. First of all, uh, how do you select that person to work within the club? And then, secondly, how does she or he carry out their role within the club on a day-to-day -day basis or on a week-to-week -week basis. Do you mean um, uh, some an employee? 
um, just the values worker that you I are ah. have within it. Oh, yeah. Steve. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so the background. Um, uh, actually, if we go back 20 years, uh, there was a case where you know when you have new players coming in and the older players were doing some sort of uh, ritual to them. I don't know the English word for it, but and that went out of hand totally. And this is this is back in 2002. Uh, and that the, the sport director then thought that, okay, so we really, really need to work with how to behave against each other. Um, so that was sort of the starting point for uh, what today is basically human rights and how we, how we meet each other. And there's no, um, we don't exclude anyone depending on, you know, gender or gender identity or religion or skin color. Uh, you know, uh, everybody's uh, supposed to uh, to be allowed to be who they are, uh, and um, uh, and that that is then the main, uh, or I would say it's the fundamental uh, principle throughout the whole club. No matter if we play Champions League qualifier with the senior men's team against Celtic, or if it's in the in the pre football school. Uh, and then we we thought it we actually we got uh, some money from the from the from the government from tax money to to start this project for a couple of years ago, uh, and um, then we saw that there was so much value to have a person in the club working with these questions, uh, and then obviously all of these um, um, say these human rights and how we meet each other it's all embedded and in, and integrated in our pedagogy and the structure as well. But, but it's very important, or for us, it's been very valuable to have that person to, to work with this throughout the club in terms of parents or, or kids or coaches. And, and the fun note here is that when you look at the registered cases uh, that he's dealing with in terms of the, when we don't see that things is, uh, is, is handled or, or gone about in, in a way that aligns with, with, uh, this, uh, with our code of conduct, it's actually 85% parents. Um, that is uh, root to these challenges. And then I guess it's 10% coaches and it's very, very few children. Uh, so so that, that's a, a, perhaps an, an insight to uh, digest. That's great. Thanks, guys. Uh, so we're going to go over to uh, AD next. Or sorry, a yeah, AD. Uh, AD, sorry. <laughs> I just unmuted you there if you want to correct my pronunciation and ask your question. No, you're, you're okay there. It's like it's uh, AD, so... Uh, hey, how are you doing? How you doing, Mark? How you doing, Dennis? All right? Hey, I'm All right. good, good. Good, good. Just a quick question, really, on uh, self-determination theory and the principles there. How does that look and feel within your club? Um, I hear Mark talking a lot about equal opportunities um, with his previous sort of webinars that he's done. How does the self-determination theory and the feelings of autonomy uh, relatedness and competence come and look and feel within that age group of eight to 12 specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, w this is quite interesting. Um, we, in the research and development, we did, um, we did a data collection with a tool called SenseMaker. Uh, I don't know if you come across it, but it's from um, Bangor University and uh, the Center of Applied Complexity with Dave Snowden and how to work and how to gain insights in people's feelings and motivations uh, in, in a workforce mainly, but, but we adopted it to, to, to try to, to get a picture of what, what do kids actually perceive in this environment. Uh, and we didn't really have a good way to ask eight to 12 year olds, but we could ask their parents. So it's not the best, um, but, but what we saw is, that, or basically what, what it is, is that you um, that the parents, they share their stories about their kids' opportunities, and that's like sort of a, the qualitative part. But then they, they place their story in a triangle of, of um, 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 relatedness, autonomy, and competence. So where does this story sit? So that means that the, the qualitative part from the parents then comes together to one, in one triangle, and that becomes quantitative uh, part. And then we can see a cluster there, and we saw that there was huge lack of um, autonomy, uh, mm. uh, at least from the parents' experience. Uh, and we also had some other reflections that were showing and some other data 
collections that were showing the same kind of pattern. So that meant that, okay, for, so then we have to be heavy on autonomy to balance out this out. And maybe in another environment, it might look differently. So then you have to be heavily on re relatedness or, or competence, for example. But for us, we have to be heavy on autonomy. And that has to be facilitated in practices. Or yeah. Uh, so, so that then, uh, that, that then had the implications for the structure that we decided to have. Uh, it, it, like the kids, when they get 13, they choose themselves in what way they want to, do they want to specialize or not? It's not our choice, it's their choice. Uh, and and the, uh, the pedagogy in itself uh, offers uh, opportunities to take decisions yourself and to have an impact yourself on the output. So there's autonomy there as well, uh, definitely in the leadership. And, and so, so it, we really, really try to, to get such a rich insight as possible in the motivations and the feelings of the participants. And from there, we can then make a judgment on where we need to wait uh, our practices and for us it was on the autonomy side so for mm. any other environment it might be something else so but for us that that was the way to work with it good thank you can i jump back quickly to one of the other questions that was suggested in terms of uh, all the age groups between 8 and 12 or mixed ability am i right in saying that there's that there are times when there will be best versus best um because that is mixed grouping is that is that correct that you still do that dennis and or, or yeah. maybe well, I've week. been asked that. Oh, Some is this, this. I, I've been sorry I had to leave my son out the door. I've been asked that um, about that. That it's it's like if you're having mixed ability groups and during a season you're mixing groups. Yeah, you are going to have probably the best at some stage claim the best at that yeah. time. You know that's part of it. Yeah, no, I, it's I, just I, that it's not cemented. No, but no. And, and the key thing here is that yes, we 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 do think that every that if this is a spectrum where you have ability grouping or equally good at one uh, good yeah, however you measure that but on one end of the spectrum and on the other end you have total mix we don't think that e that there's any point on this continuum that's the right one we think that we need to uh, play on the whole, this whole continuum uh, to offer different challenges different opportunities for learning uh, for as many as possible so so we, we talk about variable groupings uh, a lot so yes, sometimes the best play with the best against a really hard team somewhere, but that's not what's defined this group of players. Uh, it, it's, it's the learning and it's the, it's the variation in challenge that is, is the, the core, core to this. And then obviously, yeah, when, when they reach like 16 or 17, they're, they're naturally more similar because they're out of puberty and things like this. But uh, uh, there, is, there is a place for that, yes. And obviously when you're gonna, uh, step into the senior teams that, that that's uh, a selection there on on, a, on your skills for sure um, but um, but yeah it's 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 also understanding that just because that's practice when you're 16 17 18 19 it doesn't matter that that's sort of the core need when they are eight uh, so so it's just building this uh, you know how you work with the flowers that you start open and you closing it by hand as, as they grow uh, so yeah, more organic Okay, thanks guys. Cheers for the feedback. Thank that's you. that's uh, wonderful. Again, great question and, and great answer. And I really like that idea about you, know, you play with the whole continuum, depending on what it is that you're working towards. I think that's a wonderful way of summarizing it. Summarizing, uh, yeah. summarizing it. It's a useful, yeah. useful tool. Yeah, it's such, it's such a misunderstanding with, with mixed ability grouping. You think, you know, it's, that, might, that we're just going to get worse because I'd be playing with a bad player. It's not. So many great opportunities. So this has been fantastic. We've had loads of questions uh, and it, the time has flown by. We've only got time for one last question and it comes from Miles Smith. So Miles, uh, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you both for the presentation. Um, obviously, I hope you will. First of all, I apologize. You can hear some musing about how my housemate's doing a, a workout in the living room. So you know, a bit of primal scream. I apologize about that. Friday is a primal scream. Friday. Yeah, some primal scream on a Friday. Yeah. Sorry? Which tra primal scream track? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't, uh, yeah, so apologize if you can hear that in the background. However, um, let's, I'll get to the question. Um, trying to find sort of the best way to, to word this and ask this. With a, obviously, with, with the, the, the non selection process throughout certainly the younger ages, um, what would your advice be to a, to a club or an environment that's, that's trying to follow, that's trying to follow something similar, um, but with regards to the, the limited resource? And, and what I mean by that is, you have any form of criteria where you know let's say you have um a, a, an influx of players that want to join your environment what is where does it come to a position where you're unable to take 
any more players in due to resources like lack of coaching, uh, lack of lack of pitch space, all of the things that unfortunately we still we still have in the women's game. Um, and and how how would you advise to to sort of uh, reduce that selection criteria in the form of trials from that sort of tens to to fourteens bracket? If that makes sense. Well, I mean, we we also have limited facilities. We're very limited. And that's why when I showed the practice there, sometimes we're designing the pedagogy around the, the constraints of the facilities that are available to us. Um, I think in any way possible, can you investigate your own environment? Can you do some sort of your own research into your own environment? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good starting point to get yeah. the stories and the thoughts and the feelings and what people are thinking and how they feel first. And then your observations, of course, as well. And also, I mean, going back to what I said in another context, another question before was that, you know, it's, it's about, you, you, sh you should try to, to, to do what you can control as good as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you cannot control the amount of pitch sizes or whatever, that obviously that's a limiting factor. But uh, I think that if you, at least our, our, we, we have similar challenges, but if we work in this way that we do, then the lack of pitches will show and then it will become a pressure to politicians mm -hmm. and things like that. So, so it's, it's more operating from inside out rather than mm -hmm. wanting to have the, the best setup before you start doing something. So just yeah. keep doing things. And if you do things good, it will become a natural pressure out from your environment to, to your uh, uh, other environments that you, are, that you need to keep on growing or developing. So, I mean, if, if you take in players and they stand next to each other and can't move, then that's, that's a really good argument to the politicians to, to, buy, to build you another pitch. Like, like when we did our research, one of the things we found is that we have extremely dedicated people. Yeah. And that's really, so that's a massive, um, plus for us in any changing that these people are really dedicated now how can we make them help them be dedicated towards the changes we're making in the club etc but by understanding the social cultural constraints that was impinging on us and whatever the cultural resilient beliefs again we got more information and how, how to work with this yeah and one thing as well that that at least i mean we we have 1500 kids applying to our club every year uh, and what we've been doing is that we have been decide we decided that we're going to work locally with the kids locally when they are eight to twelve primarily. So because we don't want kids to travel too far to the training, they can play in their own local club for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that kind of thing as well. And because if if you are more local, it builds also a community stronger. Uh, so so that, that could be one Act way. locally, think globally. Yeah, that, that that could be one way as well to to just um sort like your, your 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 constant probably pressure from from parents or players to come to your club uh, and that actually uh, helps the your neighboring clubs to grow as well uh, so so that, that could be one way to think about it that it's proved it's been very beneficial for us to, to do that to actually have have like rings you know as as they get older and they can travel farther further yes but when they're five six seven up to twelve it should be very local and easy to mm -hmm. go there Thank you very much. Thank you, Miles. Mark, Dennis, uh, we, we've, had, we've had lots of questions there. I'm sure we could continue carrying on, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll aim to bring it to a close now. I think um, if people wanted to get in contact with you, find out more or, or anything like that, what, what's the best method? Is it is it Twitter, would you say? or? I'm, I'm never on Twitter. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, Twitter for this guy, uh, I guess. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm there and active as well. So, uh, you can, yeah. You can okay. Twitter out there. Or if they have any questions, they can send them to you and you can pass on our email and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that, sure. that's, that's fine. So, if anybody does have any, any, any questions, we'll, we'll post your Twitter handles on a follow up and, after and this. We, we, uh, we're not afraid to share anything. Like, okay whatever yeah and um for those of you who signed up to the webinar you can uh you, you'll have had our email address or our gmail address so you can contact that and, and and we can put you in touch with with mark and dennis so mark dennis thank you so much for your time this evening it's been an absolute pleasure uh you've given up your evenings with us and uh and child minding as well at the same time <laughs> so yeah thank you very much and uh just to say everybody thanks for uh thanks for tuning in this evening
Um, um, again, hope, hope that everybody has a great weekend. Just keep an eye on social media for our next webinars. We've got uh, Jorg van der Breggen and Jan Verbeek from the Dutch FA at three o'clock next Friday. Um, and we also have uh, another, another one uh, lined up in two weeks time, which is uh, Sport Ireland um, and I Coach Kids, which is uh, Sheila Quinn and Declan O'Leary. Um, and that is in two weeks time. So keep an eye on social media. We'll post the uh, registration uh, for those uh, early next week, certainly for the Dutch FA one. Um, so again, big thanks to Mark and Dennis. I uh, hope everybody has a great weekend and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Bye. Yeah.